Um, hi, uh, I'm Marcus, uh, Marcus Brady. I've been working with uh, Nine Sigma now for three years. I'm a pharmaceutical uh, nerd by training. I uh, grew some biotech companies from fairly small to much larger, but I always liked the uh, alliance formation, technology transfer, licensing aspect of it. And uh, that's the reason that sort of drove me to um, uh, take the license for Nine Sigma to Canada. But I have to say that I was uh, inspired in my biotech career uh, by the, uh, the Gold Core Challenge, and it was a treat to meet with Rob a year or so ago to talk about that. And um, it's interesting to see how the industry with respect to open innovation that I'm in has evolved so much <clears throat> in the last three to four years. Um, projects uh, and the way they're undertaken to catalyze uh, innovation are much more uh, rapid now and streamlined, of course, by that ubiquitous tool, the web. So um, uh, I'll try to interject my 35 minutes, a little bit of humor. Here's my first bit. And it remi I kind of thought this may be what happened at Goldcore when you showed up with your idea. Did you get that sort of stunned look on people's faces when you? Initially. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so, <coughs> a Nine Sigma is a 14-year-old company. Uh, we've done about 3,500 projects, and we're all about helping companies to overcome that blue-yellow uh, uh, antagonism. We're basically trying to help companies bring them um, solutions from around the world, <coughs> because what we're seeing happening, and maybe in part because of what Nathan's saying, it's in small companies, such as the ones we're talking about here at this table, where a lot of this innovation is happening. And I, don't, and I know I'm one of them. I don't like being in a company of 5,000 people. It just drives me crazy. Um, and uh, given that a large chunk of this R&D is spent is happening outside, it becomes a little bit more invisible to you guys in these larger uh, organizations. <clears throat> so uh, what I think has been learned over the course of the last I don't know, decades in innovation, <coughs> uh, and in particular in lar uh, large and small, is that uh, as the technology sp uh, development of speed of technology increases and we end up with um, more convergence, it's not so much about ownership anymore, and in particular in the mining industry, it's more about, it's not about ownership, it's about access. I mean, um, mining companies aren't going to be developing all sorts of gold sniffers, they're going to find them from other people. They're not going to be developing uh, ball grinders themselves. They're going to test them and make sure their suppliers can build them up fast. <coughs> and uh, that's basically what's driven the growth of our industry. That is to say the open innovation intermediary industry. It's uh, about uh, finding those organizations, uh, for example, one of our largest clients, GE, uh, to help them with their uh, innovation activities, help them get out of the mindset that uh, they have to do it all themselves, a closed approach, and help them um, uh, do what they do best. So just a quick definition about what OI is. It's the process of going outside your company to find solutions. <coughs> and this is, a, and I'm, I've put a whole slew of slides in here. And what I tend to do is give them to whoever's hosted me. And there'll be more information in here than I present so that you can use it later on. So uh, as you'll even see, there's hidden slides. If you ask Judith for them, I'm assuming she'll send them around to people, right? So closed is all about lots of the smart people are in the room. Uh, and they all work for us. Uh, the company gets its own innovation done, and we're going to win. Uh, we can do this faster, better than everybody else. We've all heard this story before, and I've certainly seen it uh, in spades in different industrial sectors in Canada. But I was privileged to go to, well, to host a mining innovation breakfast late last year and to go to the CIMIC one. And the, I, was pull, I was taken, and I think you were too, by how much polarization and energy there was now in recognizing that there needed to be a shift. And that shift, I think, <coughs> is recognizing that the external R&D uh, can create value for us. Not all the smart people work for us. In fact, I lost one last week to whoever, and I, bet, I wish I had him back, right? <coughs> uh, so, uh, and this is happening across many other industries as well. And we study this, as do other, other companies, and we've got lots of slides in this deck about this, so you can use them at your leisure. It speaks a little bit to your point, um, Nathan, about blues and yellows. Um, <coughs> here, the uh, uh, manufacturing, finance, transportation, this adoption of open innovation across different industries. And interestingly enough, I think what drives, uh, here's mining and construction, sort of somewhere in, in between, um, <coughs> it's the manufacturing uh, and wholesaling companies, people that really need change rapidly, 
that are m embracing open innovation uh, uh, the, uh, the quickly. It's the larger industries, the industries that have had to have been more closed, have been more um, tight-lipped about their uh, innovation that <coughs> have been a little less rapid to do so. Pardon the fuzziness. And I think it comes to this, basically, um, hey, it's easy for me to look for my keys where the light is. And let's face it, um, uh, it doesn't always work. Uh, I know I've lost mine many times and I haven't found them. <coughs> um, but I'd also like to think that we've started to realize that we, there are easy ways now to g look for the keys elsewhere. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that when, I, when we knock on doors, we're not getting these messages. And if you, I'm sure all of these messages are pandemic, or if that's the right word, uh, to your organization. Um, I, it was surprising to me that people inside our company built up such strong barriers against openness. I mean, I was, at, uh, I was sp speaking to Boeing about a month, I don't know, two or three months ago, and they said, this will never work for us. Our company is not designed for external collaboration. Oh, interesting. Um, uh, so again, helpful to know, I'll knock somewhere else. Um, <clears throat> handsome guy here um, uh, is, I think, the forefather of OI in, uh, in Canada in many ways, the first large uh, challenge that was done. Since the time of uh, this project, uh, the, uh, the speed at which contests can be dr uh, run has dramatically changed. Uh, how long did this take start to finish? about a year. <coughs> um, we're running contests now for Cisco and GE that take less than six months. Uh, so uh, all this said that it, the uh, activation energy barrier, so to speak, to get to uh, the end is uh, much more accessible now than it was. And what's been done with it? Well, <coughs> and again, I leave these slides in the deck. Um, there's six uh, stories of uh <coughs> with uh, Newmont on uh, silver extraction, uh, this project on Enbridge, they wanted new pro approaches to pipeline leak detection. Uh, over 50 solutions provided in an eight week period, start to finish, eight weeks. <clears throat> now again, um, uh, in different uh, technology approaches. And what we've learned over the course of the last, um, I guess, uh, say five years, is that it's by reaching outside of our own industrial sector, that we uh, bring in the most uh, advanced technologies that have been applied in other places so that you're able to take advantage of the R&D spend that has happened amongst others. <clears throat> and that's certainly the case in oil and gas. Uh, and it's the case, for example, in this, uh, I think it was a Schlumberger project on waste heat recovery. Um, the, the notion being that what's uh, the investments that are made in your industry uh, in R&D are focused on certain areas because for specific reasons. The investments that are made in other industrial sectors are done so for their specific reasons. By finding those overlaps and proving, uh, and proving the applicability of a technology, you end up leapfrogging uh, your problem. <coughs> I won't get into this one. <coughs> so what I'd like to do, just for a brief moment, a bit of entertainment, is uh, I'll talk to you about why this is, and it speaks directly to your point about yellow and blue. On your table is a little card, a little white card, okay? And uh, I'd like you to take a look at this white, light, light, white card, and I'd like you to fill it with a little bit of information. Uh, here, Nathan, there's a few here. Please. <clears throat> and this isn't the ideal example, but it, it'll work, and it'll show you what I'm trying to get at. <coughs> um, uh, <laughs> the curse of knowledge. The better we get at generating great ideas and new insights and novel solutions in our field, the more unnatural it becomes to communicate these ideas clearly. There's lots of literature on this. In fact, this experiment that I'm going to tell you about right now is on the 70s, and there's been all sorts of research just about this experiment um, uh, that's, been, that's been done that I'm hoping uh, will stick, pardon the pun, to you guys. Oh, look, and if you've done this experiment before, um, have, who's done this experiment before? Okay, shut up. Uh, <coughs> okay, um, you're asked uh, by your boss to take the, mat the, the matches, uh, the tacks, and the candle and do the following. <coughs> How to fix a lit candle onto a wall, a cork board, so that the candle won't drip 
onto the table. To do so, you may only use the following along with the candle, a book of matches and the box of thumbtacks. Okay, you got a minute. Draw it down. How are you going to do it? Don't look over anybody's shoulder. You got these items to use. And that's what you got to start off with, okay? Those items. Got a minute. Wax is getting on the table. Come on. Okay. Keep going. Don't see pictures yet. Want to see pictures, Theo? Picture, picture. <coughs> okay. Um, who nailed the candle to the wall with the tacks? I did it before. <laughs> you did it before. You nailed the candle to the wall with the tacks. Is that a good idea? No. Okay. Um, who nailed the box to the wall? Okay. Who did something else in that? I um, actually put it in the corner and not nail it. Oh, okay. <laughs> there you go. <coughs> this doesn't work. Okay. <coughs> Um, this works, okay? And again, it's been studied, and I'm not bringing it up to say anybody in the room is smarter than anybody else, but what I'm getting at is that um, it has to do with how uh, you present the information to people. And then that's kind of why I blew by this other slide. And when the experiment was done originally, it was the people were shown this information separate from one another, and they were shown this experiment with the, with the tax in the boxes. Guess what? You ended up with different responses. And in fact, if, depending on how you word the experiment, and in fact, depending on how you incentivize individuals, you also got different responses. <coughs> What's this mean to you? Well, uh, <coughs> uh, some people saw, want to, are driven to solve problems for themselves and for others because of the feel good. Others, as you've learned, are driven because of uh, notoriety. They want, their no they want their solution to be known globally. Others, because of the math. I mean, hey, look at the whole Turing thing that we've watched recently on that movie, right? Um, so, um, my, uh, <coughs> but it, uh, the, and the amount of prizing also has, uh, has an effect. Why am I bringing this up in the context of what you're trying to do? For the same reason I brought it up to you earlier on uh, today. <clears throat> um, when you're trying to get people to work with you to solve problems, depending on how you capture your problem, how agnostic, my terminology, you make the problem of industry and technology, the more uh, types of responses you're going to get back. So Magna ran a challenge with us recently, and it was all about breaks. Of course it's about breaks. It's Magna, right? <clears throat> But they wanted to tell the world that it had a breaking problem. No, no, we told the world they had a ceramics problem. You get a totally different pool of respondents. Um, so uh, what we're noticing <coughs> is this is what drives these unexpected connections. So when GM came to us and said they wanted a valve with sensors in it and it was going to go on thus and such car, we actually found them a solution from a Ukrainian, a Ukrainian dairy company. Okay? They'd already built the sensor, they'd already built the valve, blah, blah, blah. So, um, <clears throat> how long has this been going on and what have we learned over the last number of years? Well, in 2003, if you'd searched uh, for open innovation, you would have found 200 hits. You know, three of them would have been gold core. Now, if you do it, you get 450 million hits. Okay? Um, I'm not, I'm not saying that it's becoming as popular as, you know, some clandestine act activities, but it's pretty, that's a pretty formidable number, I think. <coughs> and why has this growth happened? Well, it's become, it's been fueled certainly by the consumer industry, right? P&G trying to get more and more products out of, the, um, uh, out of their own labs and of others. It's driven by profitability. Uh, it's driven by R&D budgets. We don't all, we don't have I don't know, do you have the money to go, to go and develop your own gold snipper? Probably not. You're going to hope that someone else does it for you, though, right? And if you could control the way in which gold sniffing companies did this for you, you'd save a lot of money. Because, what, again, <coughs> what's driving this, and there's lots of data now, <laughs> um, and not just from Nine Sigma, um, it's, it, you can reduce development time by about 50%. And you're certainly going to improve your ability to collaborate with others in the future. You may not solve the problem with 
his company today, but you may end up knowing so much about him that he'll become a partner for you in the future. <clears throat> what we're driving here is your ability to focus on your internal network, amplify your existing network, and bring it out globally. Um, <coughs> so I'm hoping that this is what drives that point home. Okay, a whole little humor, I hope. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, what we find in our process, and this is again goes back to the candle experiment, is that 50% of the responses that we get back don't come back from somebody that we sent them to. So we send it to Jim because he's optics and gold, and he goes, uh, uh, sorry, optics and metals, uh, and he goes, I don't know anything about platinum. And he sends it off to his platinum buddy in wherever, and then we get a response from him or two of his graduate students. <coughs> and uh, again, what, what we find, and this is, these are examples, that I, some of which are, well, all of them are ours, but some of which I think you've seen. This is my favorite one right now because it's starting to penetrate Toronto just recently. The, uh, what do they call it? Uh, the guy called it drinks from space. Uh, why? Because you go to the Coca-Cola machine, you press the button, and you can have cranberry lemon sprite and coca-cola knows how many times the, uh, the that button's been pressed knows if mississauga is the bastion of cranberry lemon sprite can do direct marketing to them can sell them crap right from the damn screen knows that its products aren't being tampered with all this stuff comes from sharing the problem globally and finding a partner that can innovate more rapidly around this i won't get into the other examples they're there for you guys to look at later <clears throat> Why do they do this? Again, just a quick couple of, just a quick moment. Establishing new partnerships, exploring technological trends. There are other reasons, but I'll let you guys explore them. <coughs> Benefits include cost and risk sharing. Yes, share of external innovation contributions to R&D, cost benefit evaluation of innovation partners. The great part of this whole process of looking outside for others and doing so in a controlled and sometimes anonymous fashion is that you actually get to go to shows most wins all more, more rapidly, right? Um, so half of the time, our, uh, the projects that are run in open innovation forums are anonymous. That is to say, it doesn't say, as some would boldly say, gold core seeks. It says mining company seeks. <clears throat> and I, my challenge to the group is, if you know you share a bunch of environmental challenges or a bunch of gold sniffing challenges or whatever the case may be and you're standing there at the sideline waiting I wish that technology would come like Charlie Brown waiting for the you know the game I say put up your hand and share the problem with two or three other people like CIMIC or IMII or whoever the case may be or SRC and let's get the thing done um, these are some of the folks that are already in our pool I'm not going to spend any time on that <coughs> What I want to spend time on are the following four slides. One of the companies that's selling you guys the most stuff is GE. This is their, this is their mantra, says Thomas Edison. I'm going to find out what the world needs and then I proceed to invent it. They've got a new trick. <clears throat> what they do now is, and this is in their slide deck, what biggest are our client, 4,800 team members came together to design twice as many GE product concepts and none of them was a GE employee. Oh, hmm, how do they do this? Well, this is what most people do and they just basically made their little funnel bigger, right? They get more ideas and filter them better. And then they do this. This is the part that really irks me, but it's great at the same time. I have an idea, let's ask our clients for their problems, let's get their solutions on the cheap and then sell them back to our clients. Is that revolutionary? I don't know. But we're running these things all the time, and I ask myself the question, and I'm not selling this with you with respect to Nine Sigma, I'm just saying, I ask myself, as Canadian mining companies, can we not, do we not have high accuracy, high throughput inspection issues? Do we not have uh, water and process, water processing issues? Of course we do. So I ask myself, if all of you do, and none of you have the dollars that it takes to solve it, maybe there's an opportunity here. <clears throat> Certainly, this guy um, who, uh, he was from Deloitte, right? Yeah, Deloitte. He seems to think that's the case. Um, this came out just before the mining breakfast, and it speaks exactly to what Nathan was saying at the beginning. 
business as usual is no longer uh, possible. We have to recalibrate. Um, and so it seems to me that we could recalibrate around a number of different projects. And I'm not saying, again, I want to make it abundantly clear, I'm not saying the Nine Sigma is the solution. I think the solution resides actually here in the room to a certain extent. Um, COSIA, the Canadian Oil Sands Industrial Alliance, took them two years to do it, but they put 14 member companies together to share intellectual property related to the environment. Sure, it cost them billions of dollars, but I'm sure they're getting SR&D credits on, on the back end of this. I'm pretty sure of that. And I ask myself the question, if there isn't a possibility of this to happen uh, here as well. <coughs> Examples of other projects that have been done in this space, just to hammer it home, that they come from anywhere from new uses and processes for molybdenum all the way through to imaging technologies for dark and stormy nights. No, it's not a bar scene. Um, dust suppression on large properties. <coughs> but again, this is a mining project we ran dust suppression on large properties. I didn't know it was an issue, but after reading up on it, I did. And then when it came across my desk, I sent it to the Forest Products Association of Canada. Because guess what was happening in BC? All those, those was, was a number of mills burnt down over the course of last summer, right? Had they solved the problem? Answer, no. Could you get them to look outside of where they were at? No. And I don't, I don't get it. Was it a whole room full of blues? I don't know. Um, but it did definitely, I mean, it was as blunt as this, and it still didn't actually catch them. I don't know why. I've got a slide here that, again, just for reference purposes, <clears throat> if you're thinking about, well, what is open innovation? Is, open innovation, is it only the contest, such as the one run by Goldcore? No, there are all sorts of different facets to open innovation. There are things called expert panels. There are contests we spoke about earlier on. There's, uh, looking at technology decision making, linked innovation where you bring together, uh, I don't know, a food processing company and a mining company to solve an environmental challenge that they have in wastewater flow. Again, if you're paranoid about Barrick helping your company share it, then don't bother with teaming up with them. Team up with somebody else outside of the industry that shares a similar problem that's also prepared to invest. And I recognize that you in the room don't know the food, food industry, but I'm saying there's ways to find those people. <coughs> um, and the reason that this works is there are these boundary conditions, as we call them at Nine Sigma, to make, that are fueling this change. Workforce mobility. Um, some of the folks in the room I've realized after playing in mining now for a about a year, if you're in mining, you may stay. But what I'm noticing in other industrials, there's lots more mobility. I think as more technology comes into mining, you're gonna see lots more mobility. So I don't know how it will play uh, out, but uh, that's point number one. Presence of internal uh, R&D resources, you definitely need to have them. And it's unfortunate that in the mining sector in Canada, this is being eroded, does make the potential for external collaboration a little harder. Unless, of course, you train up your folk. <clears throat> and of course, there's this development adherence to basic IP rules and expectations. No one expects to play without any intellectual property protection. That's unwise. Uh, and you need to have some game, uh, some rules to the game internally. And you have to be open enough to be able to listen. Um, sure, the guy may come to you with some wild ass uh, crazy idea, but if all he sees at the top of the fence is no, 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 uh, please read. Um, my previous discussion, first discussion with our mutual friend, Mr. P, uh, no, 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 and then or, and also no, 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 at va a valet, and then I find out they nuke 75% of their staff. Okay, well, that's fine. I mean, hey, you got to have uh, acceptance. <coughs> uh, this is how we get it done, but I'm not going to spend any time on that. Um, right. Uh, the main tool that we use to get these problems socialized is in here. Um, these are in bundles of four or five that uh, Judith put together for me. Uh, I encourage you to uh, you know, pass them around the room, steal a couple. Uh, they're, no, they're all, these are like, if you like selenium, take selenium and then pass them on. If you don't like, okay, and then if you like something else, then take something else and then pass them along. <coughs> these are examples of um, uh, uh, how we get the word out. Again, we use the term agnostic of industry and technology to make our uh, proposals and demands clear, concise, and compelling. This one here was cutting and handling uh, technology for micropolymer rods. You know, please insert reduction of selenium from coal mine effluent. 
<clears throat> this process takes eight weeks, um, start to finish. Um, and what we do with these things is we try to ensure that our company, our clients are found. Um, and this is a term that I've stolen from the folks at Johnson Controls. Who knows Johnson Controls? Okay, what do they make? Like what? Uh, I think they make electrical controls. Yeah. Who knew they made automotive parts? Yeah, I had no idea. Um, they have uh, what we call a gallery with us, and they've had over 10,000 hits on this gallery uh, for, of their technological needs in the last year. They've had 100 solid proposals on their 30 or 40 problems in the last year, and they've gone to deal with dozens of these companies. Why? Because they were found. Because most people in the room, this is an example, did not know they were in automotive parts. And clearly, um, the Thai company or the Malaysian company wouldn't even have known Johnson Controls existed, if you see what I mean, which is, I'm assuming is similar for, I don't know, in Belgium. I know is McEwen a, uh, a well-known name in Belgium? Bel I doubt it. So I like to think that you're not getting any proposals from any Belgian <laughs> manufacturing companies, right? <clears throat> and, pardon? Uh, yeah, so um, here are some examples of the types of challenges that a pulp and paper company uses uh, in, on, on its gallery. Chromophore removal and dissolving pulps, hemicellulose removal, environmentally benign cross-linking technologies. <coughs> the note, what I'm trying to get across here is that um, uh, there needs to be a, um, uh, a willingness to be found and a process inside your organization if you're interested in open innovation to funnel these uh, solutions and they come in. And the more, um, uh, <coughs> I guess, uh, s robust your process is with respect to filtering, the more efficient it's going to be with respect to producing the results you need. Um, how many proposals did you get, Rob, for your Gold Core Challenge? 10, 50, 100, how many was it? Um, well, we had 1,400 people from 50 countries take down the data. Okay. And then we had selected the semifinals. Of about 25. So about 100 or so. Okay, so 14, 100, 25, okay? <coughs> and um, my... Uh, um, uh, they must have had, I'm assuming they had people inside the organization to decide who they were going to play with. They didn't go outside with this. But now the process in some oil and gas companies is we don't even have the ability to know enough about sensors in. Um, Synovus just recently hired a nanotechnology guy. And, we, and, and the response, the, the comment was, well, he's going to sit over there, but we're not sure what he's going to do. Um, in situations like that, perhaps it makes sense to bring on experts to help you to, to uh, make this challenge. And I'm assuming that that's what CIMIC or IMII is around to help you uh, do. So <clears throat> what we need is an overarching strategy I'm proposing. Okay, you could stop smothering the innovation we already have. Okay. Uh, <coughs> There's two or three slides here to close things off, um, uh, and are just sort of little take-home messages to make to sh help you to find out, help you to remember what won't work. Uh, the four rules: uh, start your own open innovation program after a period of strong job cuts. Golly gee, isn't that the problem right now in the mining sector? So, as a consequence, if you want to get into this space, I'm encouraging you to. Uh, team up with either A, other mining organizations, or B, someplace like CIMIC, or an IMII, or a provincial research organization of some sort that can help you with this process. Um, provide a huge CTO budget to pilot open innovation, distributing it broadly all the way across your place, and, um, and using all sorts of different intermediaries and methods. Um, after 14 years, we've determined that uh, this sort of broad brush approach of distributing uh, funds and not having a stepwise process does not work. And this is the worst. Um, well, we're going to do something just based on um, whoever throws stuff into the, into the kitty. Our friends at Xerox did this, and they're still a very good client of ours. They did the first one with 10 projects. They got beautiful solutions for 10 projects uh, that didn't have internal capacity to deal with the, to advance the project, so only one of the ten got funded and got moved forward. And that isn't so much bad in the sense that one project advanced, but what it sends to the community is a message that the company is not ready. 
So I encourage you, if you're thinking about rolling and in, opening into, op into OI, that you think about this in a stepwise fashion. Uh, <clears throat> wait until a, a one project has delivered a successful solution before defining the budget and responsibilities to follow up. Um, uh, that's a surefire recipe to start a relationship with a solution provider and then basically cheese him off into um, not uh, playing with you any further. <coughs> and I was fortunate with these. Um, I just you know went to the site and Googled. Uh, there's two of them that I used before, but uh, these are some of them are fairly recent. Um, so. Uh, I'm proposing that uh, the open innovation can bring you the unexpected. Uh, I hope that you will look for the unexpected. And I hope that you'll look at, there's I don't know, 20 or 30 other slides on here that you can play with at your leisure uh, when Judith yeah. sends them around to you, the kind group in the audience. Um, there are about five examples uh, that we circulated around of projects that are, I think are somewhat mining related. If you have any questions about those or what I've presented, just please throw buns. Marcus, if I could just add to it, when we did the Gold Park Challenge, um, one of the motivations was there's there are greenstone belts on every continent, and there should be expertise there. And I found within our own exploration teams there were differing opinions on where we would find more mineralization. So by reaching out and going around the world, you touched all these pools of expertise. And what became very apparent was that the biggest gold mine in the world lurks between everyone's ears. And if you can connect those mines, you, mines, can, yes. you can get some very big results. Um, so uh, it was from a standpoint of we were a medium to small size company and I remember sitting around talking to executives across the uh, across the country and they were, were talking about what each other's doing and someone said, oh, we've got that discovery. Very few people knew about the discovery in Red Lake and I thought, this is the mining industry in Canada. So if they don't know about it in Canada, it's right. a safe bet they don't know about it elsewhere in the world. So it was a it was a wonderful way of getting these results in front of a lot of people, and it created a dissidence in the mind of investors because they come in and go, "Wait a moment, you're a mining company. What are you doing on the internet?" And it was that dissidence that made it a very memorable story over and above the grades. Right. Uh, but it is a way that we don't have all the answers, as you said, and this is another form of innovation. Our talks have gone from process controls and exploration and all sorts of analysis in the three earlier. But this is a mindset that you have to alter and say there is a world out there plus seven billion people and there are all sorts of industries and a number of them are using the same, they're looking for the same results with pieces of equipment they're using. They just have a different purpose. Yeah. Um, so it's worth exploring. Yeah. Well, be before we open it up, uh, you know, yeah, I have a similar comment. Uh, I was involved with, with the Barrick uh, challenge for uh, increasing silver recovery. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that, it, 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 it opened up the world to Barrick. Like there were, you know, physicists, chemists, biologists, you know, music teachers, people who had no idea what, what the issues were in the mining industry. And now you had them thinking about problems in mining and like you said you know there's a lot of smart people out there and they had no idea you know there was even a problem with some silver recovery in some arab mine and now you know, people knew about it so uh, there's a lot of power there. Yeah, it can be as simple as the mindset uh, and yeah, maybe you actually have to have somebody that knows about optics to do it. But I mean, if he's spending, spending most of his time look, worrying about some medical problem, um, doesn't mean he's got his mind turned to you with your problem. What were you going to ask? So this is a question that I've asked many of the executives that I've worked for in the past, which, um, which in other companies, um, I see a different reaction or behavior. Okay. In pharmaceutical aviation and stuff like that, you see a lot of uh, money being spent on R&D. And the, the 
the innovation seems a lot faster than what it's in mining. And a lot of times the answer I get is because, you know, our investors are looking for something else. Yes. Um, and it's to deliver projects that are on budget and on time, and the only way to do that is to repeat the same thing that we've done in the past because we know what that piece looks like. This mindset that uh, Rob touched upon, how do you change, and what is your proposal for changing that mindset to bring it from something like a pharmaceutical, and, and I'm not saying they're the highest, but... No, rest assured, I can yeah. tell you from my experience, yes. Yeah. yeah, and to where where mining is, or manufacturing is, and so on. But the, before you answer, please. I, I think the question is changing now, you know. When I first started, the question was, you know, how many cents per kilowatt hour, you know, how much, uh, you know, how much does it cost to pump this much water? But now it's like, you know, there's no water. You know, Chile now wants, you know, to, to go to uh, desalination and so forth. So the question is like, it's not how much water they need. You know, there's no water. There's no electricity. There's no this. There's no that. Maybe now is the time to to ask the question: How do we design new processes that? Use less water and less electricity, as opposed to how much does it cost me to, you know, to pump these electrons around? That's it. My uh, my experience in pharma, 25 years, as well as the three years now from everything from IT to food dispensing and food products in between. Uh, and these will come out in the wrong order, and they uh, so please don't take them in the order I've given given them to you. Start with a project that. Um, uh, or a set of projects that uh, demonstrate a benefit that is tangible and meaningful to a specific uh, problem you have. And I'll give you a little example um, of that, and I'll give you, I'll give you two more points. Uh, the Oil Sands Leadership Initiative came to us and said, <coughs> um, we want, uh, we have, for, because of a regulatory requirement, a, a need to monitor our impact on mammals in Alberta and how they've been doing this before. They've been counting poops and sending biologists out there to do this. They got proposals back from 17 organizations and found a drone company that wanted to, drone company that wanted to play with them. Um, and that drone company ended up investing about $500,000 of its own money in this solution because it saw the potential. My point being, pick a project uh, that uh, has a benefit to demonstrate that, you know, going down this route can have a benefit, number one. Number two is don't necessarily do it all yourself. Find something that uh, is uh, an, a cost to you um, uh, that uh, if you eradicate, you will meet a, um, a milestone or an objective and perhaps share it with others, i.e. other mining organizations. And the third came out from McFarlane. At the last talk, he said, um, he said, uh, mining companies, and in particular senior mining management, confuses research and innovation. And we need to spend uh, effort um, to demonstrate the difference between um, you know, pure R, D, and innovation. And, and I'm not saying you can magically you know, find some you know, new approach to lighting a cigar than a match and a torch or a bonfire. <laughs> yeah. The, what I am saying is that there are ways to light a cigar that you know you may not necessarily have come up with yourself. You know? um, I have an interesting story to share. I actually read about what Rob gave the Corp Challenge about six months ago. Okay. And um, I used to work at a large Vancouver-based coal producer. And some of us might know the name. And uh, basically, I wrote a paper. And uh, I circulated around to the senior management teams in an attempt for us to basically crowdsource our geological data. Um, you know, the theory being there are lots of mining companies. They all have dormant properties. We don't know if there might be some additional ore there. So why don't we sort of share our data with the world and get it analyzed exactly like we have a well-documented case study, exactly what Rob did. And so I was able to meet with the senior vice president of corporate development and the VP of exploration. And um, what they did was they placed all of the emphasis on the downside risk versus the upside potential. They sat there and they said, this is absolutely everything that can go wrong, and completely ignored the fact that we might have another $10 billion mine. Um, and the second thing they, I noticed was they said, well, our data is proprietary. We don't want to share it because um, we share it with the world, you know, X could go wrong. And so they unfortunately shut, shut it down. But, but that 
that's the, that's the circle I showed you. The blues and the greens are very good at telling you why you can't do something. <laughs> yeah, I, I can come up with lots of reasons why I can't do it. That's not what I'm looking for. You want the yellows to tell you the one way differently than you're thinking of how you can do it. So you're probably surrounded with a bunch of... We had exactly the same thing at Gold Court. People looked at it and just went, well, why would you want to do this? If we release all this data, they might buy the ground around us. Um, I said, yeah, but we have 55,000 acres and you haven't explored all of that. And then they said, well, someone could take this over. I said, well, if they're going to take this over, it's going to be at a higher price than the current market and you all have options. And, it, and most companies don't have as much management, insider management as we do, so it's going to be a higher price. Um, and then I said, well, if we make a big discovery as a result of this and you're still working here, your career has just been enhanced. So, oh, excellent. That's a great argument. <laughs> because, and, and more people are going to know about what you've done. So uh, you, you just have to look and say, what are the benefits to the people that you're trying to deliver to? And that, if you were going to resubmit that, I'd suggest Thank putting you. those benefits in. Okay, we'll have one last one. We can wrap it up at the end as well, but we want to be fair to you. So, Jim, go ahead. So I just want to talk a little bit more about what we're talking about here. If the sports psychologists say the people who are coaching Olympic athletes, people who have to perform, you know, sometimes in the course of seconds, they say you have to visualize yourself winning that goal. You have to visualize the, the thing, the, the goal that you're after. And rather than looking at the downside, I mean, I've just gone through four years of developing this goal sniffer, and it's a whole series of technological breakthroughs in a whole bunch of different areas all strung together. You always have to keep visualizing. That's what I want to get to. And if you visualize what you want to achieve, then you can get there.